and uh, Louise Stokes. Uh, there is a book about her, which might be in your library, called mm -hmm. Best Girls. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's part of my women in sports talk. Okay. Well, Tati went on uh, to become a teacher, eventually a school principal, and there is now a school in the south suburbs of Chicago named yep. after her. Yep, all part of my talk. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they're part of my women in sports talk. Thank you. All right, we are, wow. we're now live streaming to Facebook, um, and I have started recording the meeting. Um, but, Evan, I'm just going to let you jump right in and uh, talk to us a little bit about the politics behind uh, the 2021 Summer Olympics. I will be here the whole time. I'm going to turn off my camera and mute myself so as not to be distracting. But um, yeah, we've got a few people in the Zoom meeting and then on Facebook, hopefully we have some more joining us. So go ahead and take it away. Well, I want to thank you, Samantha, for inviting me. I think this is the third talk I'm doing for you by Zoom. And uh, I appreciate uh, being in uh, DeKalb and in Illinois. My name is Evan Weiner. I've been doing this kind of thing for 50 years. Um, and um, I started in 1971 in high school at the age of 15 and uh, was on big time radio by the time I was 21 WNEW in New York. And in the 1980s, I got to see uh, how the process of throwing an Olympics or putting on an Olympics um, was done. It was like uh, watching somebody cook something and throwing things on the floor because it's dirty and all that other stuff. So, uh, and some of my best friends came out of the 1984 Olympics. Uh, and some of them uh, I have to thank here. Um, Peter Ubroth wasn't my friend, but I knew him running the Olympics in LA in 1984. Harry Usher, who is the number two guy, the late Harry Usher was commissioner of the United States Football League. Uh, he passed away in the late 1980s. Harvey Schiller, Shelley Salt, and Rennie Henry uh, among the people who uh, were involved in the 1984 Olympics who uh, are friends of mine, or in the case of Shelley, passed away uh, two years ago, uh, were friends of mine. Uh, the games must go on. That was Avery Brundage, 1972, following the Munich massacre when nine Israeli athletes and two Israeli coaches were killed in the uh, terrorist attack uh, at the airfield in uh, Munich uh, after being held hostage at the Olympic Village in Munich in 1972. The games must go on. And the Tokyo 2020 or 2021 games did go on. And fortunately for the International Olympic Committee, some people got COVID, but uh, it appears that it wasn't all that serious an illness we are right now in between the main Olympics and the Paralympics, which will be starting in a few days in Tokyo. And uh, hopefully, hopefully the uh, International Olympic Committee will be able to get through uh, that couple of weeks and with a very limited, uh, very, very limited COVID in a country that is being overwhelmed by COVID or was overwhelmed by COVID as the games went on this year. So the games must go on. And uh, they did, Tokyo 2020, there was a lot of opposition to having the main Olympics and now the Paralympics in town. Uh, and uh, it was the International Olympic Committee who said that the games must go on. Let me uh, talk a little bit about the International Olympic Committee. A uh, guy I know up in um, Massachusetts, uh, who used to be the uh, head of the um, sports business management department at uh, State University of New York in Cortland, Cortland, New York, which is about uh, 220 miles north of New York City, Ted Fay. And one day he's talking to me, we're talking about the Olympics and he ran the 1994 World Junior Hockey Championships in Boston. And we're talking about uh, the International Olympic Committee and governing bodies and all that. And he says, you know, the International Olympic Committee has permanent observer status at the United Nations. I said, no. He says, yeah. And I looked it up. Since 2009, the International Olympic Committee has a permanent seat at the UN, the General Assembly, as an observer. The other who has observer st status there, the Vatican. Uh, the International Olympic Committee acts in many ways as a sovereign nation and has been requiring presidents, prime ministers, and other leaders to appear before them in the Olympic bidding. In the case of the 2020, now 2021 Tokyo Olympics, the International Olympic Committee 
not Japan, called the shots as to whether the games should be held and the games must go on. This is a lot of TV money that would be lost if the games were canceled. This is John Coates. He's the International Olympic Committee Vice President. He is from Australia and he is a lawyer by trade. He is not a doctor. He's not an epidemiologist. He does not study infectious diseases. Thomas Bach is the International Olympic Committee president. And Thomas Bach and John Coates, Bach is a former fencer from Germany, who is now the head of the Olympic Committee. Uh, and in May of 2021, neither uh, Bach nor Coates were worried about the 10 areas in Japan were in a lockdown. Coates, the International Olympic Committee vice president, recently said, or said then in May, that it was now clearer than ever that the games would be safe for everyone participating as well as the general public in Japan. While Coates was saying this, the Tokyo Medical Practitioners Association pointed out that hospitals had their hands full and they had almost no capacity left to deal with a possible outbreak triggered by the Olympics. The Olympics got lucky this year. Oh, yeah, there were COVID cases, but they didn't go, uh, the people who got it didn't go to the hospital. Uh, the major problem for the IOC at hand in June of 2021 was the COVID pandemic, and there was nothing they could do to control the pandemic. Japan was in a lockdown until May 31st. The lockdown was lifted. But it came back. Uh, there was a poll around that time in late May that suggested that three fifths of the country's residents thought that the games must not go on because of the pandemic. And there were signs like this go home, Tokyo 2020, with the five Olympic rings and the international stop sign. Go home. Um, Japan is taking a massive financial hit in the range of billions of dollars again, and the event is taking place even if it didn't take place, they were going to take a massive hit. Uh, but the IOC took a blind eye to everything going on around it, uh, the COVID, uh, the lack of vaccinations in Japan, uh, the elderly getting the vaccinations first. Uh, COVID-19 could lock down the country, but it was not going to lock down in the Olympics for a second year in a row. Olympics go home, no Olympics, just go home. Uh, in June, Japan and the International Olympic Committee agreed to bar tourists from entering Japan to watch games in person. But at that point, at that point, millions of people in Japan could attend competitions at more than 40 venues in and around Tokyo. Now, I just want to touch on this Japanese IOC decision to bar tourists from entering Japan. Uh, the Olympics, uh, the IOC through uh, their partners or their marketing partners, offer travel packages for tourists to go to a country to watch the Olympics, get all the tickets that they want to get, whatever hotels they're going to stay at, whatever restaurants they plan to eat at, whatever transportation uh, those people who are going to the games are going to take. And uh, it's generally, this is how they do it and have done it for a long time. But uh, the marketing partners basically said this time around, to the people who bought packages from them, uh, it's an act of God. You're not getting your money back. Uh, we're keeping your money. Uh, if you want, sue us. But you got to come to Japan and sue us. At that point, you couldn't fly to Japan. Uh, so that thing is still out there. They claim that they're not going to refund anybody's money, that it would be buyer beware. You should have known something was going to go on. Uh, particularly if you bought it, uh, say, in late 2019, when word was coming out of China of this mysterious illness. So right now, there may be a legal battle for people who uh, wanted to go to Japan to see the event and want their money back. And the marketing partner says, hey, act to God, we'll keep the money. Uh, in June, an International Olympic Committee spokesperson told the Wall Street Journal that the International Olympic Committee entered into the operational delivery phase of the Olympics and the Paralympics. And it has become clearer than ever that these games will be safe for everyone participating and the Japanese people. Cancel the Olympics. But is it safe? 
well, no. Uh, Japan decided um, to overrule one of the few things that they could overrule the International Olympic Committee on because they had local jurisdiction. Nobody was going to watch the games in person, watch it on TV. Why? Japan was having massive problems getting its citizens vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, only 4% of the Japanese population got their first shot through June 8th. Japan hopes to have most of its population vaccinated by November. The Olympics are now gone. Paralympics are coming. They're going to be gone. Population, not vaccinated yet, fully. But the games must go on. And the vaccination became a big deal uh, for the Olympics. An IOC spokesperson said of the main games and the Paralympics, which are upcoming, that well, they expected well above 80% of the residents of the Olympic and Paralympic Village in Tokyo to be vaccinated and somewhere between 70 and 80% of the media, but the games must go on. The games were canceled or postponed in June for July of 2020. But uh, in March, after the National Basketball Association closed up shop on March 12, 2020, followed by the National Hockey League, the national, rather Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, and the XFL, which never came back. They shut down and never came back. He, uh, Abak was insisting the 2020 Tokyo Olympics would take place as scheduled starting July 24th, 2020. Uh, after all, the IOC is in charge. They're the main, they're the main people here making all the decisions. Forget about uh, the Japanese prime minister, forget about Japanese officials, health officials, they superseded them. But uh, he was halted because a number of Olympic committees told Bach, we're not coming. We're not coming. We're not risking it for our athletes. And it would be wiser to shelve the 2020 plans and hold the gathering at another time when a coronavirus drug treatment and or treatments and vaccines are available. Uh, and eventually uh, Bach listened and postponed the games. The 2020 Tokyo Summer Olympics postponed for exactly a year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Going into July of 2021, COVID cases were increasing in Japan, still are. And there was a fight among the Japanese organizers of the Olympics and the Japanese government about the cost of delaying the event and who should be paying the extra expenses that were going to be due. The International Olympic Committee told Japan, it's now or never. We're not rescheduling this. We're either going to have it in July of 2021 or we're never going to have it. Uh, Suga Yoshihari is the prime minister of Japan. And he has no say. He's been cut out of everything. The Japanese Olympic Games cost more than $25 billion. But there was pressure on the IOC to do this. Pressure from business, the marketing partners. Pressure from some of the athletes because they have to perform to make money. And if they get a gold medal, they can make a lot more money uh, with their marketing partners or pick up new marketing partners. And media interests like the Philadelphia-based Comcast which started out as a cable, well, a little cable TV company in Philadelphia and is now the largest cable TV company in the United States, the owner of NBC and its assorted networks and Peacock, uh, the platforms that would bring the Olympics to the home. Uh, the Prime Minister Sugar's ability to host the Olympics is still being seen as a political test of his handling of the pandemic. Games must go on, no foreign fans. Local spectators, originally, they were allowed, with venues limited to 50% capacity or 10,000 fans, all of whom must follow COVID-19 protocols, including wearing a mask and no loud cheering. Because the vaccine was very limited, there wasn't any question or any questions, do you, have you got the vaccine from the show group? Didn't do it, didn't matter. Finally, the Japanese government stepped up and said, uh, no fans, we're having too big a breakout. It shouldn't be surprising that the Olympic Committee pushed the way it did in Japan or in other countries 
uh, because the Olympics is far more than just sports, far, far more than just sports. Uh, the Olympics is just more than a sporting event. Now, the modern Olympics began in Athens in 1896, uh, and the games were politicized by 1936, although you could argue they were politicized by 1904. That is an Olympics tennis player in 1900. Note the dress. Uh, it's a full dress. You can't see any bare skin except maybe the arms, maybe the face and the neck. But that's how a tennis player played tennis in 1900, uh, if they were a female. And uh, they were lucky they were in the Olympics because uh, Pierre de Corbetin, who uh, invented the modern Olympics, uh, really didn't want women in the Olympics. Um, anthropology days, a shameful two days in Olympics history. Uh, the St. Louis World's Fair, a guy by the name of Sullivan, in 1904, in conjunction with the St. Louis World's Fair, had the Olympics and had a two-day event called the Anthropology Games. Uh, 1904, Olympics organizers sanctioned what was known as the Anthropology Days. Two-day event in St. Louis where so-called uncivilized tribes of the world, taking them wherever they found them in the world, to St. Louis competed in the Olympic events of the day. James E. Sullivan brought the games to St. Louis to coincide with the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, where I believe ice cream was made for the first time. Something good happened that day. Uh, the two-day event was meant to show Anglo-Americans' cultural superiority and how savages cannot compete in sports. Basically, what they did was uh, these people who were brought there, they just handed them tools of sport and told them, go ahead compete, no training or anything else. And Sullivan got what he wanted, how Anglo-American culture was superior to the so-called savages. There is Baron de Pierre de Corbatin. You'll notice uh, as I talk, there are a lot of barons and sirs and lords and all these other uh, royalty that are part of the Olympics. The Baron brings the Olympics back in uh, 1896. Uh, but he's beginning to wonder about why do we have women? Why do we have women? 1908, 1912. And uh, he starts to marginalize sports. After the 1912 Stockholm Sweden Games, he and many of his IOC colleagues believed that an Olympiad with female athletes would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and improper. This is going against the tide globally. Uh, in the United States, you have the suffragettes uh, who uh, in 1910 were so, so loud, meeting with uh, William Howard Taft in the Oval Office, the White House, April the uh, 12th, April 14th, 1910, that he had to leave and he had to beg his staff to get him tickets to see the Washington baseball team to go out there on opening day. That's where opening day, uh, presidential opener started because he was there in the seventh inning stretch because he got he wants to stretch in the seventh inning uh and uh, so women are are around the world looking to get ahead to break the old victorian stereotypes but 1914 the international olympic committee general session made it clear no women to participate in track and field but as before allowed to participate in fencing and swimming well, Alice Milliet doesn't take kindly to this. She was a French rower, and she is arguing that women should be, if they're a rower in the Olympics, uh, her appeals fall on deaf ears. So she just she decides with another of other women that, hey, you know what? We don't need you. We'll organize ourselves. We don't need you. Uh, and one of the things that was going on at the time was the, the greatest soccer team in England was Dick Kerr's ladies, led by Lily Parr. 1921, the English Football Association literally banned women's football or soccer. But things are moving ahead, as far as women go at this point. And Milliet organizes this with other women. And it's the Women's Olympics. It's an alternative to the male-centric games. In total, four women's games were staged in 1922 in Paris, 1926 Gothenburg, Sweden, 1930 Prague, and 1934 London. 
and most of the participants came from uh, North America, Western Europe, and Japan. The New York Times covered this event, and whoever was covering it for the New York Times was impressed. 1922 was notable for the development of women athletes in all branches of competition fitting to their sex. Remarkable progress was made by them. And almost overnight, they assumed a place of great prominence in the world of athletics. Um, they did not, uh, the women did not need uh, by 1938 their own Olympics because they were welcomed back into the main Olympics. Um, that is Franklin Roosevelt, 1936. He makes a decision and four years ago, uh, Hyde Park is about an hour from my house. And I do other talks like uh, the early days of television. Roosevelt was the first American on commercial TV in 1939 from the New York World's Fair and also why he allowed baseball to continue uh, after uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th, 1941. And also, uh, why'd you allow the Americans to go compete in the Berlin Olympics and, and um, give legitimacy to Adolf Hitler's regime? I must say, FDR and Elidor, they were gracious hosts, had books for us, made us feel at home. And I got my answers for 36. Uh, as far as being on TV, he was a natural in front of crowds. And as far as uh, allowing baseball to play after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, it was good for American morale. But uh, let's talk about 1936. In 1935, the former assistant secretary for the United States Navy, a guy by the name of Ernest Lee Jack Nate, who is German uh, or German ancestry, and uh, the judge, Jeremiah Mahoney, a uh, state judge in New York, also the head of the uh, AAU, the, uh, athletic, uh, the Amateur Athletic Association in the United States, uh, or union rather, push for an American boycott of the 1936 Berlin Summer Games. Mahoney had some juice as the head of the AAU. He's the guy who picked the team. Uh, Jack Nee uh, was an American International Olympic Committee delegate. And of course, being a former uh, assistant secretary of the Navy, he still got uh, confidential reports and, uh, of what was going on around the world. He was entitled to that. Uh, and he expressed outrage with the reports that he's been given with what's going on in Hitler's Germany. On November 25th, 1935, he sends a letter to the International Olympic Committee president. Here's this one's a count. You got it, Baron. You got a count here. Count Henri Belay Latour floating the initial idea of an American boycott of the 1936 Berlin Games. Uh, Mahoney uh, recommended that um, America drop out of the game. And he's joined by a number of Catholic leaders, he's a Catholic, uh, including the New York governor, Al Smith, and the Massachusetts governor, James Curley. They're going around the country calling for a boycott. Mahoney makes his first pitch for a boycott on December 8th, 1935. The Berlin or Hitler Olympics was politically charged. Mahoney got no. Uh, Jack Nee never got a uh, letter back from the IOC, but the president of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, urged the American team to go to Berlin, knowing full well about the strangulation of Jewish rights in Germany. Avery Brundage, the head of the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee, overruled the AAU, told the Olympians, there were seven Jewish Olympians uh, on the team, but told all the Olympians they should compete in Berlin. Um, in my career, in radio. Uh, I don't know if it's dumb luck. It's probably dumb luck. But uh, from the 1936 Olympics, I worked with Marty Glickman at the Marty Glickman Broadcast Schools School for NBC, basically, in the late 1980s. I knew Sam Stoller. He ran the Milrose Games in New York. And in 1993, I interviewed Gretel Bergman in America, known as Margaret Lambert. Margaret, they're giving a given name and she married Dr. Bruno Lambert uh, around 1942, I think, or 38, rather. She became a citizen in 1942. Uh, so I knew them. Jesse Owens and others impacted by the Berlin Games. So I'm going to talk about uh, Gretel, um, who was uh, born uh, Margaret Bergman in uh, Germany. And she was about 23 years old in 1936 when she missed the Olympics. She was 22, actually, when she missed the Olympics. Um, I interviewed her, New York Athletic Club, on the west side of Manhattan, 
on 7th Avenue uh, and 56th Street. And uh, this is 1993. The uh, United States Olympic Committee has uh, this big, big news conference. They're honoring all kinds of people. And they honor a German athlete who never competed for America, although she became an American citizen in 1942, named Gretel Berg. And I knew the story about Gretel Bergman. Um, she uh, was the brightest uh, athlete Germany had back uh, in 1933, but Hitler comes into power and starts taking away rights from Jews, Romans, or gypsies, and other political enemies. And, uh, but they allowed her to continue to compete, to go, to stay on this team and compete, and compete, and compete. She had equal the German women's record in the high gym. Two weeks beforehand, she's told, you're not on the team. The Germans sacrificed what was a legitimate chance for a gold medal with this action. So here I am, I'm here with Marv Schneider and Bruce Morton and a couple others. And uh, back in those days, because I usually threw the bomb throwing question, <laughs> let me ask the first question. But I didn't have much of a question to ask for Gretel Berg because I knew the story. It was actually a one word question. Why? Her answer, I was the great Jewish hope. You gotta understand something. You gotta understand this. All our rights were systematically taken away. Our homes were taken away. Our schools were taken away. Our work was taken away. We were relocated. I was there, I was trying to give our people some hope, just a little hope. She found out that she was nothing but a dirty, rotten Jew. 1937, she was able to obtain papers that allowed her to immigrate to the United States along with her boyfriend, who was a fellow Olympian by the name of Dr. Bruno Lambert. They landed at Ellis Island, got over to New York City, had $10 with uh, $20 between them, $10 each, all the money that the Germans would allow them to take out of the country. She would work as a masseuse, a housemaid, and later a physical therapist. But she had a new life. There she is with her husband, uh, Bruno Lambert. But she had a new life. She continued to participate in sports and was hoping to make the 1940 American Olympic team. She won the 1937 38 U.S. Women's High Jump Championships, 1937 Shot Put Championship. She married Dr. Bruno Lambert, 1938. She became a citizen in 1942. But there was there were no Olympics in 1940 and 44. When the Olympics returned in 48, she was too old to compete. She faded into obscurity until her introduction to the Jewish Hall of Fame, Wingate Institute in Israel, 1980. Her legacy, the IOC honors her in Atlanta in 1996, one of the few things the IOC has ever gotten right. Uh, they gave her a gold medal because she would have won a gold medal in 1996. HBO, Ross Levinson, Fuchs, that gang over there, Levinson, Fuchs, they went after her and said, we want to do something. We want to do something. We want to do something special on you. We want to do it. We want to do it. She said, no, 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 no. She wasn't going to go back to Germany. But finally, Levinson and Fuchs in 1999 got her to go back to Germany, a stadium, Lampham, uh, where she used to train, was renamed in her honor. The HBO special, which was called Hitler's Pawn, H-I-T-L-E-R-S, Hitler's Pawn, P-A-W-N, P-A-W-N, came out in 2004. She died in Forest Hills in Queens in New York uh, at the age of 103 in 2017. No boycott. Marty Glickman said he was gone. He's the guy on the left, fastest kid in Brooklyn. You may have the book in, in, in the library called The Fastest Kid in Brooklyn. He was going. He was going to show the Fuhrer. He's going to show the Fuhrer that, that gold medal around his neck. He was going to stick it in his face. Sam wasn't like that. Sam was very, very quiet. Never talked to that. Marty, hey, Marty, good morning. How are you? May that Avery run that you rot hell. Uh, they never got to uh, run the Olympic uh, event, the four by 100 meter relay. Uh, their places were taken by Ralph Metcalf and Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens would win the gold medal and the Fuhrer would turn his back on Jesse Owens. It's not the only time that politics has come up in the Olympics. 
1964, South Africa thrown out because they supported or they ran an apartheid government. On August 18th, 1964, South Africa is banned from the Olympics. They were barred from taking place in the 18th Olympics Games in Tokyo because of the refusal to condemn apartheid. They were tossed out of the International Olympic Committee's Group of Nations in 1970 because of apartheid. Uh, 1968, Mexico City, the Black Power salute, and Peter Norman becomes a non-citizen in Australia. That is Tommy Smith in the center and John Carlos in the right. The Olympic Project for Human Rights. If you look at uh, Peter Norman's shirt over the Australian uh, logo, there is uh, a patch. Same patch that uh, Tommy Smith in the middle is wearing and John Carlos on the right. The Olympic Project for Human Rights. Tommy Smith, an athlete originally advocated for a boycott of the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games by the United States. He wanted South Africa and Rhodesia uninvited from the Olympics. He wanted the restoration of Muhammad Ali's world heavyweight boxing title, which he felt, and uh, I do as well, uh, Muhammad Ali never got due process. The, the uh, title was stripped and uh, he lost his boxing license because he refused to uh, be sworn in with the armed forces in April of 1967. Oh, they wanted Brundage to step down as president of the International Olympic uh, Committee. And also uh, what you hear still to this day, uh, particularly in football, the hiring of more African-American assistant coaches in all areas of the Olympics. Uh, there was the protest. Uh, the protest had been carefully planned. As Smith and Carlos walked to the podium, they took off their shoes to protest poverty. You gotta remember, this is 1968. Civil Rights Act had been passed in 1964, but generations of African-Americans uh, were still stuck in poverty. They wore beads and a scarf to protest lynchings. When the national anthem was played, they lowered their heads in defiance raised their fists in the black power salute that rocked the world. And their gloves were split, two black gloves. Tommy Smith kept his right one. He gave his left one to John Carlos. Peter Norman, the Australian, suggested that for their protest. There is the podium, there are the fists in the air, and there is Peter Norman from Australia, who's about ready to become a non-citizen of Australia, even though he lived there for the rest of his life. Smith and Carlos, Tommy Smith on the 50th anniversary, 2018 said, I don't like the idea of people looking at it as a negative. There was nothing but a raised fist in the air and a bowed head acknowledging the American flag, not symbolizing a hatred for it. Carlos who worked eventually as a guidance counselor, Smith worked at Oberlin College as, as a teacher, also a coach. He happened to be a football coach uh, at Oberlin who coached my wife's uh, cousin Nathan over there, and they, they still have a friendship to this day. Carlos, who worked as a guidance counselor at Palm Springs High School in California, told the Guardian newspaper, I had a moral obligation to step up. Morality was a far greater force than the rules and regulations they had. On his left breast, the Australian Norman wore a small badge that said Olympic Project for Human Rights, an organization set up a year previously to oppose racism in sports. It was set up by a guy by the name of Harry Edwards, who I know. Uh, he is a, uh, a philosophy professor over at uh, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. It's about 6'10", weighs about 300 pounds. Uh, and he is the bridge actually between uh, Carlos and Smith and Colin Kaepernick. He helped Colin Kaepernick go through whatever he went through after protesting uh, the uh, 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 police killings by taking a knee during uh, the national anthem while in his San Francisco 49ers universe, uh, uniform uh, in 2016. Kaepernick was blackballed after that. Norman said, split the gloves. Norman asked a member of the United States rowing team if he could borrow a badge that read the Olympic Project for Human Rights, a project set up to oppose racism in sports. But Tommy Smith was able to get a shot at pro football, the American Football League, the year before the American Football League merged with the National Football League. So theoretically, it's the National Football League. 
even though they didn't play each other during the season and there was a merger and shuffling and all that. But Cincinnati Bengals, American Football League, paid dues to the NFL. And he plays for a year with the Cincinnati Bengals for Paul Brown, who once told me, I don't care about color. It could be green, yellow, black, Martian. They can play football. They're on my team. Uh, Smith and Carlos. Uh, Smith played one season with the Bengals. Carlos was on injured reserve one year for the Philadelphia Eagles and played one year with the Montreal Alouettes in the Canadian Football League. Brent Musburger, who is still out there uh, in his 80s and has the greatest agent uh, ever invented in the world, his brother Todd Musburger. Uh, 1968, Brent was very upset with Smith and Carlos in the Chicago American. He wrote this, Smith and Carlos look like a couple of black-skinned stormtroopers holding aloft their black gloved hands during the playing of the national anthem. They sprinkle their symbolism with black track shoes and black scarves and Black power medals, it's destined to go down as the most unsuitable demonstration in the history of protest. Smith and Carlos have statues in front of the United States Olympic Committee headquarters in Colorado Springs, and Musburger is still pushing, still pushing odds on NFL games. Oh, and he wasn't done in 2017 after Kaepernick. He's on Twitter. Uh, Kaepernick uh, was with the San Francisco 49ers, then not with them in 2017. Uh, and uh, Musburger says, yo, 49ers, since you instigated protests, two wins and 19 losses, how about taking your next knee in the other team's end zone? Um, a little postscript to this. Whenever Smith and Carlos were in the same room with Musburger, Musburger ran fast to get out of the way. He did not want to ever confront them, ever talk to them about that 1968 article. Smith and Carlos kept their medals. They were never asked to return them to the International Olympic Committee. 1972, the first time Americans saw ter uh, terrorism in their living room uh, or their bedroom, ABC TV, the Munich 11, the nine Israeli athletes and two coaches, uh, killed during a terrorism attack in at the 1972 Olympics. The massacre, uh, the day of terror starts 4.30 in the morning, September 5th, 1972, which is 9.30 in the evening in the Chicago Midwest time zone uh, on September 4th. Eight Palestinian militants affiliated with Black September, a militant offshoot of Palestinian group Fatah, and also uh, a group that tried to assassinate uh, King Hussein twice in 1972 of Jordan and went to war with Jordan in 1972 until they were pushed out, fled into Syria, ended up in Lebanon, and stayed together. Uh, scaled the fence surrounding the Olympic village in Munich. Described as uh, athletes using stolen keys, they forced their way into the quarters of the Israeli Olympic team. At around 10 p.m. on September 5th, three o'clock in the afternoon in the Midwest. Uh, Germans, believing they had reached an agreement uh, with the terrorists, the terrorists led their bound and blindfolded hostages from their quarters into buses that transported them into waiting helicopters. Jim McKay deserved an Emmy. Jim, Jim McKay deserved the highest award that television journalism could give out 1972. He was absolutely magnificent painting the picture for people at home. McKay started out as a newspaper person with the Baltimore Sun back in the 1950s. He actually was a game show host in New York in the 1950s, ended up with the wide world of sports, and he is the anchorman for uh, the 1972 Olympics, and he is absolutely brilliant. This is unfolding. He is relaxing. He's swimming. He's eating. And uh, an ABC producer says, we need you on the set immediately. Don't even change. Here's a shirt. Here's the tie, here's the jacket, leave your swim trucks on. We're gonna shoot you from the waist up. You gotta go on, we got a terrorist attack. Uh, and he's brilliant for 14 hours, absolutely brilliant for 14 hours. By 12.30 a.m. on September 6th, which would be 5.30 in Chicago and DeKalb, Midwest time, the shooting stops. The 20 hour reign of terror is over. 11 Israelis have been killed along with one Munich policemen, five Black September terrorists lay dead, three of the government captured. At three in the morning, local time, eight o'clock in the Midwest, McKay, who had been on for 14 straight hours, summarized the tragic outcome of the botch rescues with the words, 
They were all gone. German authorities never did storm Building 31. They allowed the terrorists to take the hostages by helicopter to a nearby military airbase. There, the Germans planned an ambush and rescue operation, Well, it was bungled badly. Nine Israeli hostages were killed by a combination of terrorist gunfire and a hand grenade that one of the Palestinians set off in a helicopter as it sat on the ground. Oh, oh I'm not happy. I actually dealt with Nixon from 85 to 88. He settled the Major League Baseball umpires, Major League owners' uh, uh, work dispute or paid dispute. 1985, he gave uh, the umpires a big pay raise and got to know him a little bit after that. Oh, don't call me Mr. President, call me Dick. Uh, Nixon, Dick Nixon, don't call me Mr. President. Dick Nixon in the telegram demanded that the rest of the games be called off, the most powerful man in the world, right? You know, but uh, not to the International Olympic Committee because they're more powerful than Richard Nixon. The games must go on. It's Avery Brundage. The games must go on. He has this news conference or gives this whatever he's doing, pep rally, whatever it is. He gives this pep rally, uh, which is supposed to be a memorial to the slain Israeli athletes. At the memorial service on September 6th, he announced the games would continue. Oh, this is a guy who right before the Munich Games said that the 1936 Berlin Games was the finest ever. He also built uh, office buildings in Washington in 1937 for the German government. Brundage was a central character in German Olympics history. Mark Spitz did an interview with Mark Spitz in 1999 uh, over at the uh, Grand Hyatt in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, the Jewish American swimmer Mark Spitz set a record of winning seven gold medals, and he was sprinted out of Munich to London because, being Jewish, he could be a, a, a high valued target of the terrorists. A news conference celebrating Spitz's achievement hurriedly canceled. In 1999, we sat down for an interview, and this is part of the interview. These are his words, not mine. This is Mark Spitz. The swimming program had stopped. I swam all my events in that evening. The last day of competition was on Monday. And this happened on Tuesday on the morning. Swimming was through, so I didn't have to compete anymore. I had the press conference right afterwards on Tuesday. And that's when everyone told me about this Israeli tragedy or the thing that was happening at the time. It hadn't turned into a major tragedy at the moment, at least at that time. They didn't know much about it. The next day I was whisked away. As far as Brundage, I finally got around to uh, the memorial after his pep rally or whatever he was doing. He offers a 27 word tribute to our Israeli friends. Brundage was the IOC, and the IOC ordered the competition to resume after 34 hours. Uh, I knew Howard Cosell rather well, and uh, <laughs> I am friends with his uh, grandsons, uh, Justin, Colin. Uh, and uh, Jared, who is an uh, ESPN lawyer. And uh, Howard would often say, uh, at Avery Brundage, he became of age during the time of William of Orange. So I'm in Delft, Delft uh, in the Netherlands. I speak on cruise ships. I'm done on the cruise ship. So I decide, hey, why don't we go countryside and see what it looked like? And I run into the middle of the square, and there it is, the William of Orange Grand Cafe. Uh, it was in Delft that William of Orange came of age and uh, sent that picture to his uh, his grandkids and they just laughed. You knew Papa really well. They used to call him Papa, P-O-P-P-A. You knew Papa really well. And I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Apartheid in the Olympic boycott of 1976. 25 African countries skipped the 1976 Montreal Summer Games because New Zealand's rugby team played contests in Apartheid South Africa. The African countries protested to the International Olympic Committee about the IOC's refusal to ban New Zealand, New Zealand from the 1976 Montreal Games and walked out. Montreal Games uh, two, the, uh, recently were the most expensive games ever because the stadium that uh, most activities took place in was expensive. And it kept breaking and breaking and breaking. They couldn't put a roof on it. It was, it was a mess. Uh, the legacy of the 1976 Montreal Olympics is debt and the boycott. Olympic Stadium was supposed to cost $250 million Canadian, ended up with a price tag of $1.4 Canadian. 
The city, province, and Canada didn't pay off the debt of the 1976 Olympics until November 2006, 30 years after the closing ceremonies. Two weeks after uh, they paid the final bill, they were back in the bidding for the Olympics. That's Jim Craig. You remember the 1980 uh, Olympics? Uh, that's him with my son. He was uh, the goaltender on the uh, United States Olympic hockey team. And the flag dra draped around his shoulders and was saying, where's my father? Where's my father on ABC TV? The American boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. United States President Jimmy Carter forces the United States Olympic Committee to drop out of the 1980 Games because of the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan, which is in the news right now. The Carter Doctrine. The Carter Doctrine said that the Soviets attempt to gain control of Afghanistan and possibly the region was regarded as a threat to US interests and Carter was prepared to meet the threat with military force. Uh, his official announcement came on Meet the Press with Lawrence Spivak on January 20th, 1980. Unless the Soviets withdraw their troops within a month from Afghanistan, the Olympic Games must be moved from Moscow to an alternative site or multiple sites or postponed or canceled. Uh, Lord Killian, <laughs> another one, Lord, Lord Killian, Baron, <laughs> a Lord, uh, a Count, <laughs> um, wasn't going to listen, and he didn't listen. All of this, the backdrop for the uh, United States Olympic hockey team uh, playing the Soviets. Now, I was at the game in 1980 at Madison Square Garden where the Soviets just blew the doors off the American team, winning something like 10-3. So, uh, not much was expected from the Americans, but they did get to the medal round. Um, on February 24th, 1980, the U.S. hockey team beat Finland to win a gold medal at the Lake Placid Olympics. They won the gold medal against Finland, but everybody remembers they beat the United States, or rather the Soviet Union, even though nobody saw the game live, except if you were in Buffalo or Detroit or one of the border towns, because it was in the afternoon and ABC didn't put it on. CBC did. The Americans made up of mostly college players upset the favorite Soviet team that may have been partying a little too much the night before. With the Cold War setting, setting the stage. Soviets set up shop in Afghanistan. The Olympics became bigger than life. Uh, and the United States team would beat the Soviets who might have partied a little hard the night before. Uh, the American hockey game, or the hockey game, took place on February 22nd. The Americans win. The game takes on a life of its own. It became known as the Miracle on Ice because of the ABC announcer, Alan, Al Michaels. I was on a show with him in 1999, produced by his sister, Susan. Worst show I've ever been on, maybe the worst show ever on TV, called History's Mysteries, the... <laughs> The history of sports from 4,000 years ago through 1998. But anyway, uh, at the end of the game, he says, do you believe in miracles? Yes. And the only reason he's doing the game, he's the only announcer on the staff of ABC who knew anything about hockey. The Lake Placid game was the first event that where the USA, USA, USA chant was ever heard. Carter called to congratulate the team for being the Soviets. It was only a game, but politically and culturally, it was the most significant sports matchup of the 20th century. And that includes India-Pakistan cricket matches. Um, should we boycott the Olympics? By the way, the Americans did beat the Finns and they had to win that game and hope that the Soviets didn't, didn't score that many goals in beating Czechoslovakia, convoluted. It was all convoluted, but in the end, the Americans did win. The Soviets could have still won the gold medal. Should we boycott the Olympics? March 21st, 1980, Jimmy Carter announces the U.S. will boycott the Olympic Games scheduled to take place in Moscow that summer. The announcement came after the Soviets failed to comply with Carter's February 20th, 1980 deadline to withdraw troops from Afghanistan. And Carter did a few other things. Grain is a weapon. He increased pressure on the Soviets to abandon the war in Afghanistan by issuing trade embargoes and two U.S. goods. And the country desperately needed grain and information technology or computers. He restricted Soviet fishing in American controlled ocean waters. The United States team, which consisted of more than 160 athletes, coaches, and support staff, 
could not compete in Moscow. And Carter showed that he was meaning business. Any American who went to Moscow could have lost his passport. The Soviet boycott. Did it work? No. Carter did get Canada, West Germany, and Japan to join the boycott for Britain, France, and Greece. And I'll show you said no. Uh, oh, the Lake Placid legacy uh, up in Lake Placid, where the U.S. wins, the USS, USA, USA chant starts. The Lake Placid legacy, the other one, is the Olympic Village was turned into a prison. Uh, Carter's initiative failed. The Soviet Union left Afghanistan in 1989. The Soviet and Warsaw Bloc countries boycotted the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. That is my friend Rennie Henry, who's up in Seattle, who actually put together the last Ford Carter debate in 1976 in Virginia. Rennie and me up in Seattle, we talk a lot, a lot about the Olympics. He was there at the beginning of the Los Angeles Olympics in 1977. He goes to the White House with uh, Peter Ugaroth and a lawyer by the name of James Argue, A-R-G-U-E, Argue. Uh, the International Olympic Committee awards Los Angeles the Games in 1984 with no requirement of new venues. No other group bid for the Games in 1977, and if there was another group, it was in Tehran, Iran, and uh, the U.S., or rather the International Olympic Committee wasn't interested. Uh, they ventured to Washington. They sat in the White House waiting for Jimmy Carter. They wanted to make a pitch to Carter for American dollars. They never got a chance to meet to, with Jimmy Carter. They were too busy. Ubaroth opens up a checking account for 100 bucks for the Los Angeles Olympic Committee with his own money. He commercialized the games, and it is the last Olympics to turn a profit. Uh, virtually every Olympics since 1984 has lost money. The 2004 Athens Games contributed to Greeks' insolvency. Uh, the Soviets and the Washington Pact countries did not go to L.A. Oh, the Atlanta legacy, uh, that would be not much, except Richard Jewell uh, would be accused of bombing uh, Centennial Park and killing somebody. And NBC would say it was Richard Jewell, but it wasn't him, it was somebody else. Jewell would sue NBC, they reached a settlement, but his reputation was destroyed. Oh, there was an Olympic stadium built it's now a very small stadium for a Georgia football team, college football team, low-level college football team, served as the home of the Atlanta Braves for 20 years before they went to Cobb County. 2004, Athens Games, a major financial drain on Greece and continues to do so to this day. In 2006, um, 2006 the uh, International Olympic Committee wanted Italy to change its drug laws against steroids. Italy had some of the toughest drug laws in the world. IOC said, no, 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 no. They're not breaking any laws. They're not breaking any laws. They're cheating. Let us handle it. Let us handle it. Please let us handle it. China becomes more accepted in the world community. They host the 2008 Games. Oh, uh, in Vancouver, part of the deal going to Vancouver for the Winter Olympics in 2010 includes the censorship of people like me at the library. Uh, they, if I came up and said I was going to do uh, this uh, talk at the local library, they had the right, the International Olympic Committee had the right, not the library, the International Olympic Committee had the right to cancel somebody like me, not the library, as part of the deal cut for Vancouver to get the 2010 uh, Winter Olympics. Uh, Tony Blair, Putin, Lula, they all genuflected uh, in front of the International Olympic Committee. They begged for games. Blair in 2005 for the 20, uh, uh, 2012 games in London. Putin in 2007 so he could get the 2014 games in, in, the, in the Russian Black Seaport Resort of Sochi. Uh, and the Olympics, they were interested, the International Olympic Committee, in money, money, money. Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, China. The BRIC countries, there's money to be made there. All their economies are overheating in 2006, 2007, and they want part of that money. Uh, more than a decade ago, they fell in love with the BRIC countries, and they decided Brazil was the place they were going to go. So uh, in 2009, the next Olympics becomes available. No Olympics ever in South America. Money is there. We're going. It doesn't matter who else bids. 
The country had oil, lots of it, and had money to invest in sports events. But the global economy cratered in September 2008, and the price of oil dropped significantly. Uh, the Brazilian president Lula was still popular when he left office in 2011. But the drop in oil prices, staggering costs of the 2014 World Cup soccer event in Brazil and the 2016 Olympics ended Brazil's ascendancy into the world of the big boys economy. Where's Obama? Where is he? Why isn't he here? Olympic bids are so important these days to countries that it would be surprising for a country not to send its biggest hitter. If the US doesn't match the others, that's something that will be noticed, said Dick Pound from Montreal, International Olympic Committee member from Canada, Dick Pound. Barack Obama did go to Copenhagen to beg the Olympic Committee for their votes so Chicago could have the 2016 Olympics. He appears before the committee, as does Lula. The IOC wanted the South American Olympics, and uh, even Obama admitted that Lula at that point was the most popular politician on earth. Luiz Lula da Silva got Brazil the 2016 Olympics. The 21st Century Olympics, the Olympic Committee demands local governments pay for any debt accumulated by the games. Sydney's paying hundreds of millions of dollars, of Australian dollars rather, to maintain unused facilities. The United States had more troops on the ground in Utah to protect the Salt Lake City Olympics in 2011 than in Afghanistan after the September 11th attacks. 21st century, London rebuilt the East End with the Olympics, no more than what it cost. Sochi, $51 billion. Rio, nobody seems to know, but a number of people have gone to jail for bribery over there. The International Olympic Committee wanted to hold games in South America. They got it in 2016. Brazilians were not happy with the cost of holding, hosting the World Cup and the Olympics, took to the streets to protest. South Korea, 2018, money loser. But South Korea invites North Korea to participate in the games, and Thomas Bach is a peacemaker. So he sits. Uh, and there is Thomas Bach. Today, he claims the Olympics Never been as successful as they are now. TV deals, yeah, through 2032. Sponsorship through 2028. But he says they can't ignore that they have an issue with the candidate process. And now they just go to the city and say, uh, do you want the Olympics? And Brisbane, uh, Australia said, yeah, we want the Olympics. And they just got the 2032 Olympics. The 2024 Olympics going to Paris, 2028 to Los Angeles. Nobody wanted those Olympics except those two cities. Uh, Bach, I don't need to go into detail how the Olympic Games is used for political purposes by groups in some countries. It's all about politics with the Olympics, all about politics. So uh, rather the Russians want the 2020, 2036 games in St. Petersburg. Salt Lake City wants the 2030 games. And it's going to be about political leaders showing will to get the games because Boston said no to the 2024 games. I want to thank Samantha. If you have any questions or comments about the politics of the Olympics or any uh, or anything else, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Samantha, for inviting me. Thanks, Evan. That was really interesting. Um... I lived some of it. I lived some of it with those yeah. guys. <laughs> um, Elizabeth and Michelle, did either of you have any questions for Evan? And you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask them verbally, or you can uh, type them in using the chat function and I'll read them aloud. Okay, uh, nope. Uh, Michelle says no. No questions from Elizabeth. <laughs> nope. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Samantha, for giving me the opportunity to speak in DeKalb three times. Uh, maybe we'll do this again in the future. Uh, I would tend to think that we might be all better off if I didn't because I've been covered to go away. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for, for doing this for us. Um, you know, the, the upside to doing things virtually is we um, get to expand our reach, um, not just with the audience, but with our presenters as well. So thanks again, Evan for um, giving us a really, really nice program today. Well, thank you. And again, thank you for inviting me. And uh, 
hopefully uh, we could do something in the future. Um, you never know. But again, thank you. And thank uh, everybody for showing up here, uh, Michelle and uh, somebody else who I forgot. And also everybody on Facebook Live, thank you so much for watching. And for those who watched on YouTube, thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the summer and uh, have a good fall. And maybe we'll see you somewhere down the line. Thank you again, Samantha. And my name is Evan Wood. Thanks again. Thanks, Evan. Thank you, everybody else. Bye-bye.